Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the Gospel of Mark, a series of lessons just working our way through the Gospel and seeing what we can learn that maybe we have missed in the past from the Gospel of Mark. This is lesson number seven in that series for August 17 of 2024, entitled Teaching Disciples Part One. And we're going to find out that <clears throat> this time period that we're studying right now is, is a lot of teaching for the disciples. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider these lessons, as we think about what you are trying to do and trying to teach, help us to realize that the messages, many of them, are for us. May we learn, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come to the dividing line in the Gospel of Mark. What we have studied so far focuses on who Jesus was. Now, if you think about it, with the abilities that Jesus has, how long should it have taken to convince people who he was? I mean, I don't know, it seems like after the first miracle, people would figure out he wasn't just an ordinary human being, right? What was holding them back? Preconceived ideas. We have studied so far, what we have studied so far focuses on what Jesus was. The disciples, especially Peter, were prepared to say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But after Christ, the Messiah, remember Christ is the Greek word, Messiah is the Hebrew word, same thing. The anointed means the anointed one, the Son of the living God. That was Peter's confession. But after Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, had reasonably settled in the minds of the disciples that he was the Son of God. He needed to begin teaching them about what was coming. He also needed to teach them about what their future lives would be like and what it meant really to be disciples of Jesus Christ. These lessons are very important even for us today. The section of Mark from the middle of Mark 8, which we're going to be talking about today, through the end of Mark 10, is bookmarked by two cases in which Jesus healed blind men. Is this also a challenge to us to understand what Jesus was going to teach about his future life and death and our roles as disciples? Well, let's look at those two cases. We'll start with the one at the beginning. Look at the healing of the first blind man. Jim? Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. They came to Bethsaida, where some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begging him, excuse me, begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. After spitting on the man's eyes, Jesus placed his hands on him and asked him, can you see anything? The man looked up and said, yes, I can see people, but they look, but they look like trees walking about. Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes. This time the man looked intently. His eyes returned, excuse me, Sorry. eyesight returned and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then sent him home to, with the order, don't go back to, into the village. Now, you, you know, today we would say he probably had cataracts. Okay. Just removed them. Okay. Then Jesus and his disciples went away to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, tell me, who do people say I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist, they answered. Others say that you are Elijah, while others say that you are one of the prophets. What about you, he asked them. Who do you, you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus ordered them, do not tell anyone about me, American Bible Society. Okay, there's a little bit of history we should add here to make this clear. Jesus intentionally took his disciples up to this area of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was an area outside of Jewish territory, and even today you can go there. I visited there. There are a number of temples to pagan gods scattered around there. And so Jesus is saying to them as he walks around and they're looking at all this stuff, he says, okay, take your choice. Who do, what kind of a God do you want to worship? Who do people say I am? So it was in this context. 
okay? There are, in fact, a number of recorded incidents in which Jesus healed blind people. Blind Martha Maus was healed in Mark 10, 46 to 50, too. And the man born blind, as recorded in John 9, was also healed. But there is something interesting about the story told in Mark 8. First of all, it is only in Mark that this story is told. Why would that be? Any suggestions? That's Peter. Well, it says Jesus took the man outside of the village, right? Maybe Peter was the only one who saw it. That's a possibility. It's not in any of the other Gospels. Secondly, it is the only miracle in which Jesus took two steps to bring the blind man to perfect vision. Why is that? From the Go ahead, Jennifer. Was, if, oh, Jim. Everything Jesus did was also to teach something. It was a yeah. lesson he was trying to leave them with, rather than just doing a, a magic trick. And, and yeah. uh, it, 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 it was trying to especially their understanding. Especially this time, since when his whole focus is on trying to teach the disciples. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. From the Bible study guide. But why two touches? As this is the only miracle in which two actions are involved, it is not likely because of any lack of power on Jesus' part. Instead, it is more likely an acted parable, illustrating how spiritual insight sometimes takes time to unfold. That is what is happening for Jesus' disciples. The entire section, Mark 8, 22 to 10, 52, begins and ends with the healing of a blind man. In this section of Mark, Jesus is especially teaching his disciples about his coming death. They have trouble grasping it, even though he tells them numerous times. Just like the blind man, they need, quote, two touches to see clearly. Restoring of sight becomes a metaphor for insightful discipleship. If I remember correctly, Naaman didn't, took more than two dips in the, in the Seven. river. Seven dips. So. All right. Didn't happen once. It is interesting to note that Jesus spoke definitively about his coming death on three separate occasions. Gordon? The first one is recorded in Mark 8, 33, 31 to 33. And now that one we know more familiarly from Matthew 16, the Peter's confession. Okay, that's, that was the first kind. Of, and that's the time when they're up among the among the pagan places up there, Caesarea Philippi, outside of Jewish territory, in the northern end of the Decapolis, the, the ten, the ten uh, G Greek towns. Okay, so the that's sec the second that's, time Jesus spoke. A second time about his death, and again, it's mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Okay, and then three, Jesus spoke a third time about his death, Mark ten, thirty-two to thirty-four, and, uh, and, and also I wanna, in Matthew and Luke. Yes, I want to read the Luke 18 passage. It's one of my favorite ones. As you know, I've read it many times. I have it marked in my Bible, as you can see. Jesus, they are on their way from Jericho up to Jerusalem on their last journey, okay? Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem where every, everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, what in that verse is hard to understand? Are there any of those verbs that are 15 syllable verbs. <laughs> this wasn't part of their paradigm. They're, they're well, the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. We're talking about a few days before the crucifixion, the last trip up to Jerusalem. It just didn't fit what they thought they knew. They, well, and, and if you go to Ellen White's thing where she spells out, and you, you, you're sure that this is true. You don't have to have Ellen White to tell you, but the whole crowd, they were, they were in, you know, at this point in time, Jesus is collecting a lot of people. You know, everywhere he moves are big crowds because, why does he want the big crowds? He, they, he wants them to be witnesses to what's gonna happen. And they think that he's gonna be king. They, uh, they are marching him up to Jerusalem because they are gonna make him king. 
I'm going to be a little facetious here for a second, and that is, he had a golden opportunity to say, I'm going to die, I'm going to pay all your sins up, and you guys aren't going to... <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says that, yeah, and yet yeah. what, do, what do the churches peddle? Yeah. Falsehood. There are other passing references to his death. We, of course, do not know how many times Jesus talked about this, uh, this subject, which were not recorded, but, I mean, three times, absolutely unequivocally spelled out, and they still haven't figured it out, and they're on their way to Jerusalem. Teachers love questions. They are often the key to unlocking a student's understanding. In this passage in Mark 8, the turning point of the book has arrived. Three characteristics confirm this assertion. First, Jesus questions his disciples about his identity, something he has not done before this point. Second, Peter is the first person, not formerly demon-possessed, <clears throat> who declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Third, immediately following this revelation of who Jesus is, he begins to explain where he is going to the cross. Why does Jesus tell his disciples to tell no one that he is the Messiah? It seems counterintuitive for establishing the kingdom of God. However, in Jesus' day, Messiah had political overtones of overthrowing Romans, Roman rule. Jesus did not come to be that kind of Messiah. Hence his call for silence on his identity from our Bible study guide. Okay, now. I think that last part is a surprisingly good explanation. I, I like that, yeah. yeah. Are there times when we should not speak about even important things like the gospel or about the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection? Well, you know that there are pl places in the world where if you speak openly about that, you can be imprisoned and killed. So that would be an example. Okay, Mark 8, 31 to 38. That must be, that's Jim? Mine, okay. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. Now I'm gonna interrupt for again for a second. If you read the chapter in Ellen White's writings uh, about Judas, he figured it out. He went and talked to the to the, you know, to the Sanhedrin said, I will see, he, this is what's going to happen. So, and, and he thought, well, it's going to happen anyway. I might as well get some money out of it. Uh, I think Ellen White also says Judas thought he was going to force Jesus force to him. oppose it and to actually become king. Yep. And he would get the credit. Either way, he was going to win. Yeah. He ended Sounds up. Sounds like some recent things that have happened. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Jim. Uh, he made very, excuse me, he made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned around, looked at the disciples and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from human nature. Then Jesus called the crowd and said, excuse me, and his disciples to them. After, if anyone wants to come to me, he told them he must forget his self, forget self, carry his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Do people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their own life? Of course not. There is nothing they can do to gain their, can regain their life. If a person is ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory, to, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels from the Good News Bible. Wow. Mm. That's a real intense lesson there, isn't it? Yeah, this is the crucial point of which Jesus turned from the first half of the Gospel of Mark, which identifies him as the Messiah, to the second part, which begins talking about his death and resurrection. Readers of this gospel, of course, already know from earlier in the book that the crucifixion was coming. What do you think the disciples thought when Jesus mentioned the cross? Cross? What are you talking about? 
-hmm. We don't want anything to do with any crosses. Why would one choose to carry a cross? I mean, what was it that prevented the disciples from understanding what Jesus was talking about? Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide, when Jesus first called the disciples, he said he would make them fishers of men, from Mark 1, verse 17. There was no talk of trouble. But now that they really know who he is, he unfolds to them the goal of his mission, that it is necessary for him to suffer many things, to be rejected and killed, and then to rise again after three days. They had thought that they were to become rulers of the people after Jesus drove out the Romans. Yeah, I mean, when Jesus called them, did they have any idea at all that all but one of them, well, all well, but two of them, I guess, Judas, of course, hanged himself, but John probably died of a natural causes at 90 plus, but virtually all the others ended up being martyr martyrs. And they tried to kill John. Yeah. Right. Why did Jesus immediately rebuke Peter, even apparently calling him Satan when he tried to contradict Jesus' teaching about the crucifixion? From Ellen White, Desire of Ages, Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. Desire of Ages 415. So what does it mean to take up the cross in our society in 2024? Do we need to be picking up wooden crosses and carrying them around? Well, you know, they do, Christians do that every year at Easter time, going up the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem. Should we be doing that? Gordon says no. Gordon says no. Look around you in the world and ask yourself what people are working for or towards. How many are working for fame, fortune, money, or power? How many are seeking to follow Jesus? Hmm. Think about some very important names that you could probably mention right off. And people ruling large nations. They're absolutely power hungry. Are any of them seeking to follow Jesus? I didn't know whether I dared ask that question. So I did. <laughs> Not even their part of their vocabulary. Followers of Jesus are called to have the same goal he has, to take the cross and to follow him. Crucifixion was the most cruel, humiliating, and intimidating method of execution that the Romans had. And I know we're in our post-Victorian era, we put uh, cloth around Jesus, but I can assure you, when you, you are crucified, you're crucified without a strip of clothes on of any kind. It was intended to be humiliating as possible. Everyone wanted to avoid the cross, so why would anyone want to take up the cross as a symbol of their devotion to Jesus? Jesus explains not only the cost of discipleship, but also its great value. In the paradox of Christian faith, losing one's life becomes a way to find it. In contrast, getting the whole world by forfeiting eternal life is nonsensical. As mission Jim, missionary Jim Elliott put it so eloquently in his journal of October 28, 1949, and you remember this is the gentleman who went to down to try to evangelize a very um, vicious and dangerous tribe in Ecuador. And he wrote in his diary a few days before that, before he died, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. I love that. That's an, I'm going to read it again. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Think about the implications of that. And if you have this handout, as you can download from our um, website at uh, theox.org, T-H-U-X.org, you can hit, hit, click on that link there and read more of his story and about other people who said something similar earlier. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Sort of the same idea, John 12, 25. 
How have you experienced the reality of these words? From our Bible study guide. Okay, Jim again. John 12, 25. This is from the Good News Bible now. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Good News Bible. Now, does that mean really to hate our life or does it mean it's willing to give it up for sure, that's following it. Jesus? Yeah. Well, okay. I like that phrase there in uh, Hebrews 2, 14, 15. Oh, yeah. Through fear of death, they're in lifelong bondage. I'm going to take us to uh, Mark 9 to, to read a few words here. And he went on to say, I tell you, there are some here who will not die until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And then, of course, there's the story. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and then led, led, led them up behind the mountain where they were, were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus, and his clothes became shining white, whiter than anyone in the world could wash them. Then the three disciples saw Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Teacher, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He and the others were so frightened that he did not know what to say. Sounds like he just, just did say something. Then a cloud appeared and covered them with a shadow, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my own dear son, listen to him. They took a quick look round, but did not see anyone else. Only Jesus was with them. And then I'm not going to go back to read the, the rest of the story. We'll talk about that in a moment. Why do you think Jesus took only three of his disciples when he climbed up the mountain at nighttime? Doesn't that sound like he's being prejudicial? Favoritism. Is he picking them out because they're going to be good examples or... Or is it some other reason? Well, you know that there is some evidence that James and John were cousins of Jesus. So, um, was he being this a little nepotism? Somehow I think not. Okay, the idea that some people are standing there and near Jesus would live to see the kingdom of God come in power has puzzled a lot of people. The obvious answer is the transgression which happened six days later. Transfiguration. Oh, transfiguration, I'm sorry. Gordon? From the Bible study guide, Elijah and Moses appear from the heavenly realm and converse with Jesus. Luke notes that they were talking about Jesus' departure, the Greek exodus, that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem, mentioned in Luke 9. Thus, the scene of glory is tied to Jesus' coming death on the cross. It would give hope when the di disciples saw him crucified from the Bible study guide for okay. Tuesday. Okay, and here are the verses that were mentioned there. Luke 9, 30 and 31. Suddenly two men were there talking with them. They were Moses and Elijah who appeared in heavenly glory and talked with Jesus about the way in which he would soon fulfill God's purpose by dying in Jerusalem. So now we, we, we had those three times when he was talk to them about dying in Jerusalem. Here's another time. Moses and Elijah are talking with them about that. But the disciples don't hear him, I don't think, do they? They hear Jesus, or Jesus, they, Moses and Elijah talking I think they heard Moses and Elijah talking. Um, anyway, Mark 9, 9 says, And they came down the mountain. Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. What did the disciples think he was talking about? When Jesus told the, the three disciples that Elijah had already come, was he telling that, them that just as John had been killed, so he would be killed? However, he would rise again after three days? I mean, why, why didn't they at least ask him, what do you mean after three days you're going to rise again? It seems like at least that part what do you mean you're going to be killed? That's the... Well, yeah, but I mean, even if, if you're killed, I don't know, anyway. Malachi 4, I guess that's mine. The Lord Almighty said, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send you the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, I would have to come and destroy your country. Hmm. So when is, if you read the expression, the great and terrible day of the Lord, what do you think of? Um, 
I didn't think that was going to be a difficult the question. Prophecy talk about the day of the Lord is it's not a, a pleasant uh, experience here. <laughs> well, we usually think about the second coming. Well, and who is in the who is the Elijah who is that is to come just before the second coming? Aren't we supposed to be that Elijah? Spreading around the world the truth about the three angels' messages. Mm. Mm. How, do you, how, how, how are your Elijah words coming out? Well, at the top of the mountain, Jesus and the three disciples had seen a vision of heaven. When they reached the bottom, they saw almost a foretaste of hell. Okay, who's next? This is Jim. Mark 9, verses 14 to 29. When they joined the rest of the disciples after the transfiguration, they saw a large crowd round them and some, excuse me, and some teachers of the law arguing with them. Then the people saw Jesus. They were greatly surprised and ran to him and greeted him. Jesus asked his disciples, what are you arguing with them? What are you arguing with them about? A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you because he has an evil spirit in him and cannot talk. Whenever the spirit attacks him, it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth, grits his teeth and becomes stiff all over. I asked your disciples to drive, out the, drive the spirit out, but they could not. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Jennifer, if you saw a child doing that, what would you think? Epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Hmm? As a neurologist, I'll answer that. Okay. This is a seizure, an it epileptic looks, seizure. Sounds like an epileptic seizure, doesn't it? Yeah. I thought the pediatrician would, get, would beat you to it, but she, she didn't. She said it softly. <laughs> yeah, she said it quite softly. You got to speak up, Jennifer. I know. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Jesus said to them, how believing you people are. Unbelieving. Me, yeah, how unbelieving you people are. How long must I stay with you? How long do I have to put up with you? <laughs> Bring the boy to me. Wow. They asked, they brought him to Jesus. So is he saying that to the disciples or to the people? He's saying that to the disciples. And I think he realizes that he's getting closer and closer to crucifixion. And he's desperately worried. When are these guys going to get it? This is the best teacher. This is God, the best mm -hmm. teacher there ever has been. Yeah. And he can't get them to, to understand. But yet, if you go and back and read, well, and in fact, you think about this. Jesus must have chosen the best people he could find. And yet... He has to pick them where they're at in their yeah. life experience. You know, they, they have not only the learning what he's trying to teach him, but they have all this misunderstanding from, from before. And the, the unlearning is, is a painful process. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. Keep reading. Okay. I didn't, where, where did we start here? As soon as they saw... Okay. As soon as the Spirit saw... As soon as the Spirit saw Jesus, it threw him, the boy, to, into a spit. So they fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has he been doing this? Jesus adds, asked the father. Ever since he was a child, he replied. Many times the evil spirit was has tried to kill him by throwing him into, into fire and into water. M have pity on us and help us if you can, if you possibly can. Jesus said, excuse me, yes, said Jesus, if you yourself can, everything is possible for a person who has faith. The father at once cried out, I do have faith, but not enough. Help me have some more, have more. Mm. Jesus answered that the crowd was closing in on them, so he gave a command to the evil spirit. Deaf and dumb spirit, he said, I order you to come out of the boy and never go into him again. The spirit screamed, threw the boy into a bad fit and came out. The boy looked like a corpse, and everyone said, he is dead. But Jesus took the boy by the hand and helped him to arise, and he stood up. So that, that was a post uh yes. <laughs> period. It was very short, apparently. Yes. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive out the spirit? Only the prayer, oh, excuse me, only prayer can drive this kind out, answered Jesus. Nothing else can. 
And if you read this story in Ellen White, she said they were arguing with each other how come they had not been taken up in the mountain with Peter and James and John. They were jealous. Hmm. The forces of Satan can have great power over a person if she or he has allowed that. <clears throat> if she or he did what? Allowed. allowed it. So Satan can't have power unless God, unless they, I mean, unless we allow him to have power. Okay, Jennifer. From Ellen G. White. Some poor souls who have been fascinated with the eloquent words of the teachers of spiritualism and have yielded to its influence afterward find out its deadly character and would renounce and flee from it, but cannot. Satan holds them by his power and is not willing to let them go free. He knows that they are surely his while he has them under his special control, but that if they once free themselves from his power, he can never bring them again to believe in spiritualism and to place themselves so directly under his control. The only way for such poor souls to overcome Satan is to discern between pure Bible truth and fables. As they acknowledge the claims of truth, they place themselves where they can be helped. They should entreat those who have had a religious experience and who have faith in the promises of God to plea with the mighty deliverer in their belief, in their behalf. It will be a close conflict. Satan will reinforce his evil angels who have controlled these persons. But if the saints of God with deep humility fast and pray, their prayers will prevail. Wow. Okay. Jesus will commission holy angels to resist Satan, and he will be driven back and his power broken from off the afflicted ones. Mark 9, 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Okay, that's from volume one of the testimonies way back in Ellen White's very early days. Satan's power over beings was present with Adam and Eve, and even before that with the fallen beings that had been, uh, in, that had been in heaven. Gordon? From Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White. The angels warned them, that is Adam and Eve, to be on their guard against the devices of Satan, for his efforts to ensnare them would be unwearied. While they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them, for if need be, every angel in heaven would be sent to their help. If they steadfastly repelled his first insinuations, they would be as secure as the heavenly messengers. But should they once yield to temptation, their nature would become so depraved that in themselves they would have no power and no disposition to resist Satan. Well, we have taught several times in the past, and I'm going to say it again now. There was one simple answer to that problem. All you have to do is stay away from the tree. All you have to do is stay away from the tree. And it's there, and you can see it, but you don't have to go over to it. I mean, this was, a, this was supposed to be a protection for Adam and Eve. God says, you know, you could have the whole rest of the garden. Everything, everything you could possibly wish for is out there for the taking. You don't need that tree. Satan is confined to that one tree. Yes. So this is supposed to be a protection for Adam and Eve. It's not a temptation. It's supposed to be a protection. We read a passage there where the disciple Jesus was sounded like he was a little bit frustrated with them that they weren't learning. Mm -hmm. But the heavenly intelligences, yeah. they were around. They didn't learn until Jesus, according to yeah. Colossians and Ephesians, uh, yeah. it, it, until Jesus' death. Yeah. So they had all these experiences uh, up, up for thousands of years. We don't mm -hmm. know how many. And, and then, until they finally got it. And then you say something that Jesus died for the sinless angels. Oh, no, no. Oh, yes. Well, I just read the text. It is interesting to note Jesus' response to the Father's statement, if you can, Mark 9, 23. Suddenly the Father realized that he also had a problem. It was not just his son who had a problem. He pleaded for more faith, and Jesus healed his son. Have you ever... That, that, that point there. Faith, but the, all of this uh, process is is an education on, on mm -hmm. the part of these the uh, these people that are being involved with this thing, mm -hmm. 
and it takes time so that they become persuaded, not just do some magic trick mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, well, they, it's like the number came up, like they won the lottery. No, mm -hmm. they, he wants to instill some really principles that they can carry um, through the life man, with. The man is there and, and his, his son is having attacks right on the spot. And he realizes, I think he realizes, this is my last chance yeah. for this boy. And so, have you ever had an experience in, you, in which you felt it was necessary to cry out for more faith? <clears throat> well, the next story we find is in Mark 9, 30 to 41. It began with Jesus' second statement about being handed over to the Gentiles and dying. But unfortunately, the disciples had not yet grasped the significance of Jesus' statements about what was coming. They were still arguing about who was going to be the greatest when Jesus would overcome, overthrow the Romans and set up his kingship in Jerusalem. On this occasion, as well as on others, Jesus made it very clear that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who is a servant of all. And he added that we must be willing to welcome even a small child, small child in his name. And of course, as we know now from having read this story many times, Jesus finally says, I think I need to demonstrate what I meant by being a servant. And then it was that in the upper room, bending down and washing dirty feet. And I think the disciples at that point must have said, he was serious. <laughs> he was serious. But they still didn't get it. <laughs> Next in the is the story of John, the trying to stop a someone who was casting out demons in the name of Jesus. But Jesus assured his disciples that anyone who is not against us is for us. In nine, Mark 9, 38 to 41. And I don't know whether we, maybe we can take time to read those few verses. John said to him, teacher, we saw a man who was driving out demons in your name. And we told him to stop because he doesn't belong to our group. Do not try to stop him, Jesus told them, because no one who performs a miracle in my name will be able soon afterwards to say evil things about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I assure you that anyone who gives you a drink of water because you belong to me will certainly receive his reward. Imagine Jesus' thoughts about what to say and what not to say as he gradually unfolded what was coming before his disciples. How do you tell some your best friends that are totally dependent upon you and just your, their whole lives are wrapped up in you and you say, I'm going to die. In fact, I'm going to be killed, you know, in the worst possible way. Jim, I think you're next there. In the, from the Bible study guide, in the first prediction of his coming death and resurrection, Jesus refers to those who reject him and kill him, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. In the second prediction, Jesus refers to the fact that he will be betrayed. The betrayer is not pointed out at this time, but the reader already knows who it is because of the identification of Judas. See Mark 3, 19. We'll look at that in a moment. Again, the Lord refers to the being, excuse me, to being killed and then rising after three days. But the disciples seem even less interested in the details of this prediction than of, in the first. Unwelcome news does not garner discussion from the Bible study guide. Okay, then there's Mark three nineteen and Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. That's back from earlier in the gospel. Jesus did what he could to stop the discussions about who would be first in the kingdom. From, uh, Jennifer, go ahead. From the Bible study guide, Jesus responds to the problem in two steps. First, he utters the clear statement that to be first or greatest, you have to become a servant. Then Jesus illustrates his meaning by an action. Evidently, a child was standing nearby listening. Jesus takes the child and places him in the midst of the group. That would be intimidating for the child. But then Jesus takes the child in his arms, relaxing the scene. He teaches that if you receive the child, you receive him. And if you receive him, you receive his father. Thus, the lowest child is linked to God himself. And another passage, he says, these, the angels of these children 
stand around my Father's throne in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark 9, 42 to 50. From the Good News Bible, if anyone should cause one of these little ones to lose his faith in me, it would be better for that person to have a large millstone tied around his neck and be thrown into the sea. So if your hand makes you lose your faith, cut it off. Wow. It is better for you to enter life without a hand than to keep both hands and go to hell, to the fire that never goes out. Interesting teaching, but it isn't a teaching. And if your foot makes you lose your faith, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life without a foot than to keep both feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye makes you lose your faith, take it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with only one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into hell. There are the worms that eat them never die, and the fire that burns them is never put out. And where did he get that idea? Everyone will be purified by fire. Well, I got that from the, the dump just Isaiah, outside Jerusalem. Well, but it's, this is a direct quote from Isaiah 66, yeah, which 24. Was, which was from the dump just outside yeah. Jerusalem. Continuing but, with verse 49, everyone will be purified by fire as a sacrifice is purified by salt. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have the spirit of friendship among you, among yourselves, and live in peace with one another. From the Good News Bible, Mark 9. Wow, cutting off one's hand or foot or taking out one's eye seems extreme. What was Jesus trying to suggest? Surely Jesus was using hyperbole. We would think it to be a disaster to lose a hand or foot or eye. However, how much greater would be the disaster to be, be to lose eternal life? And every time we sin, we are choosing death. Mm -hmm. It should also be noted that Jesus was not teaching the idea of an eternally burning hell in this passage. At first, this is from our Bible study guide, at first this passage may seem to be a collection of disparate, disparate teachings of Jesus thrown together without any rhyme or reason. However, a closer look reveals that each successive teaching has a catchword connection to the previous one. The passage revolves around three main terms that move the instruction forward step by step. Causes to sin is one expression, fire is an expression, and salt. The first teaching is about little ones, referring to new believers. Teachers and, te and leaders are tasked in the kingdom of God with the responsibility to care for these new converts with special care. Similar to the Old Testament ethic of caring for those weakest in ancient, ancient society, widows, orphans, and foreigners. Jesus speaks in hyperbole that it would be better to be drowned in the sea than to cause one of these little ones to sin. So now we've talked about losing hands, feet, and eyes. And now we've talked about being drowned in the sea with a millstone tied around your neck. The catchphrase, cause to sin, leads to the longest teaching in this passage. Two conundrums confront the reader. First, is Jesus really teaching people to cut off a hand or foot or pluck out an eye? Second, is he teaching an eternally burning hell? The answer to the first question is no. Jesus is not teaching mutilation. That, that is, mutilation was rejected in Judaism compared to Deuteronomy 14 and 1 Kings 18. The Lord is using hyperbole to make his point. If losing a hand, foot, or eye is terrible, how much more is disaster should it be for the Christian to sin? Oh boy, it's getting real personal now, isn't it? So who do we consider to be the greatest in our day? Jim? From Ellen White, before honor is humility. To fill a high place before men, heaven chooses a worker who, like John the Baptist, takes a lowly place before God. The most childlike disciple is the most efficient in labor for God. The heavenly intelligences who can cooperate with him who is seeking not to exalt self, but to save souls. He who feels most deeply is his need of divine aid will plead for it, and the Holy Spirit will give him, give me, give unto him glimpses of Jesus that will strengthen and uplift the soul. From communion with Christ, he, he will go forth to work 
for those who are perishing in their sins. He is anointed for his mission, and he succeeds where many of the learned and intellectually wise fail. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 436. So what is being said here is this, the, to spread the gospel is primarily God's work. We just cooperate. We, many of us are very reluctant to try to do anything about spreading the gospel because they, it's a huge, big old thing, and how could I ever do it? God says, no, you don't have to do it. Just cooperate with me. Let me do it. Let the Holy Spirit go into action here. Well, do we as Seventh-day Adventists owe anything to our neighbors and friends? Wow. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Ellen G. White. By all, that has, by all that has given us advantage over another, be it education and refinement, nobility of character, Christian training, religious experience, we are in debt to those less favored. In debt. And so far as lies in our power, we are to minister unto them. If we are strong, we are to stay up the hands of the weak. Angels of glory that do always behold the face of the Father in heaven, joy in ministering to his little ones. Trembling souls who have many objectionable traits of character are their special charge. Angels are ever present where they are most needed with those who have the hardest battle with self to fight and whose surroundings are the most discouraging. And in this ministry, Christ's true followers will cooperate. Wow. So our job is to do what? Cooperate. Mm -hmm. Not always easy, but that's, that's what we're told. When you read Peter's confession about Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of the living God, as recorded in Mark 8 or Matthew 16, uh, how would you have responded? Do you think Mark, in writing Peter's gospel, has convinced you that Jesus is indeed the Messiah in these first eight chapters have we seen convincing evidence that Jesus is the Messiah well it's easy for us to say that in our day and for, with our Christian background can we learn to take sin so seriously that we would rather be maimed than to sin on the cross Jesus noted that being separated from his father was so awful that it led to his death. It is sin that separates, it separates us from God, Isaiah 59, verse 2. And it is sin which will lead to the final destruction of the wicked. Do we want to be um, among that group? As we have mentioned, we are at the dividing point between the first half of Mark and the second half. In the first half, Mark tried to establish the Messiahship of Jesus and his sonship to God. In the second half, Jesus was preparing the disciples for his crucifixion. Do you think that the transfiguration on top of the mountain was an adequate exclamation point to, uh, to that first half? And as you, Jesus is talking about them to the disciples coming down the mountain, he says, don't tell anybody until after I'm risen from the dead. Does that mean he did not want them to say anything even to the other disciples? Or is he talking about to the crowds? What do you think? Hmm. Oh, to the crowd. To the crowd where the um, Pharisees and scribes yeah. stood here. In most of the stories that we have discussed so far in Mark, although the disciples were present, they are not involved. But when it comes to deciding um, about who Jesus really was and is, they are directly involved. And when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus commended him. Unfortunately, when Jesus moved on to start talking about what was going to happen to him in the future, Peter tried to stop him. Was it harder for the disciples to accept the idea that Jesus was not going to be the king of the Jews or to accept the idea that he might die in the hands of the Romans on a cross? Or both. You were supposed to have that choice. <laughs> or the latter. All of the above, right. What did the other disciples think when Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan? Mm -hmm. Were they thinking, okay, now he's putting him in his place. 
Jesus could not permit anything to get in the way of his assigned path to his crucifixion and resurrection. It was his knowledge of God's plan for his life that kept him going. Wow. I'm sure those night se nighttime sessions with his father were absolutely essential. Okay, Mark 9, 2 to 7, you remember it was the story of the transfiguration. We don't need to read it again. Do these verses raise any questions in your mind? From the Bible, SDA Bible commentary as quoted in the Bible study guide, it is significant that all three synoptic gospels record the narrative of the transfiguration immediately following this prediction. And furthermore, all three mention the fact that the transfiguration occurred about a week after this statement, implying that the event was the fulfillment of the prediction. The connection between the two sections of narrative seems to preclude the possibility that Jesus was re here referred to anything but the transfiguration, which was a miniature demonstration of the kingdom of glory. Yeah, very good. A comment by R. Allen Cole may be helpful in this, uh, uh, this junction. Juncture, I'm sorry. The verse, Mark 9, 1, must therefore refer either to the transfiguration, which falls immediately after, which seems reasonable, or to later events still within a human lifespan, such as Christ's triumph on the cross, confirmed by his resurrection, or to the coming of the Spirit, or to the later extension of the blessings of the kingdom to the Gentiles. So he's thinking, you know, maybe it includes all those things. Jesus was desperately hoping that at least his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, would digest the information about the transfiguration and not lose hope through the upcoming events. So now, at least at the point where Jesus is being crucified, do you think Peter, James, and John were able to say anything to the other disciples and to the other followers of Jesus? Those are the kinds of questions I, I like to ask myself and boys. Anyway, Ellen White says, Jim? The disciples are confident that Moses and Elijah have been sent to protect their master and to establish his authority as king. So what are they going to do? What do they think? They're going to make him king. Yeah. Right. Okay. But before the crown must come the cross, not the inauguration of Christ as king, but the, de but the decease we don't use that word so much now. To be, we, we use the word deceased. If a person is dead, it's deceased. But the decease is the... To be accomplished at Jerusalem is the subject of their conference with Jesus. So they're talking about, and this is, this is why I asked the question earlier, did they understand the conversation between Moses and Elijah and Jesus? Because it says here, they're talking about what's coming up for Jesus. Well, I don't think until after the resurrection, probably until they met him there at the upper room for, for, the, for the afterwards, where he went through the door without opening it. It was too, it was too incredible. They, they couldn't even believe what the women told them. No, no. Okay, Jennifer. In the Bible study guide, the transfiguration was, figuratively speaking, a preview of the magnificent event at the end of the days, the second coming. Such a glorious event filled the disciples with amazement. Before their eyes, Moses and Elijah appeared and talked with Jesus, from Mark 9, 4. According to Ellen G. White, both Moses and Elijah represent the redeemed. Elijah represents those who will not taste death, and Moses represents those who will rise from the dust. Okay, moving on to Ellen White. Gordon? The Desire of Ages says, just what Jennifer said, upon the mount of the future kingdom of glory was represented in miniature, Christ the King, Moses a representative of the risen saints, and Elijah of the translated ones from Desire of Ages 421. So which would you rather be among, the translated or the risen? I'm going for the translated. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have to live through the time of trouble if you want to do that. Do we recognize that the first half of Mark is to establish his sonship and his messiahship? Do we acknowledge that the transfiguration uh, uh, occupies a very important point in Mark's gospel? 
by it, the Sonship of Jesus Christ is cemented in their minds? Is it important also to notice that when the Father was speaking about His Son, He said, listen to Him. What is implied by that? As we've noted on other occasions, listening is a synonym in the Bible for the obedience that comes from understanding. Such obedience or listening involves a daily surrender to Jesus Christ, to Jesus Christ. So each day we need to learn more about Jesus Christ and practice following him. So how do you think you would have responded if you had been on that mountain with Jesus when God the Father spoke about him? The disciples were terrified. Mark 9, verse 6. After the transfiguration, he, Peter, and the others were so frightened that he didn't know what to say. Now that's a bad situation for Peter. He always had something to say. It's a bad situation for most of us. Yeah. Are we prepared to take up the challenge of discipleship and of avoiding sin as far as possible in preparation for the second coming? Is avoiding sin easy to do? You're supposed to know the answer to that question, right? It's not easy. Why is it not easy? Because it comes naturally, right? We've done it before, we keep doing it, it's a habit. And Satan and all his angels know that this is a life, the only way they can go on living is if they can keep us sinning. And if, they, if we succeed in, in stopping from sinning, what happens? It's the end for them. It is, well, it's not the immediate end, but that, that it's, it's a fixed amount of time that, that, that's still available. So, um, in this lesson, we've talked about the first half of the disciple of Mark being establishing his messiahship and that he is the son of God. And the second half, which we're getting ready to come up, of course, we're going to talk about what? Teaching the disciples. Teaching the disciples and teaching them specifically about what? That they never seem to learn. <laughs> about his, his coming in, what's coming up, the, the crucifixion and his death and the way he's going to be treated by the, the, the Jewish leaders and so forth. So there's a long way to go. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we realize that even though you picked out people that you regarded as the best that were available, you had a real challenge. And we know that you are the very best teacher that's ever existed on this world. And yet, what a tough time you had with them, trying to get these messages across. And we're inclined, those of us who've had been through these experiences some, to realize it was, it was probably harder to get them to unlearn the things that they were sure were true than it was to teach them about the things that were true that they had to learn. May we not make that same mistake in our time as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.